It's so good to be in God's house today. Come on, if you're happy to be in God's house, come on, let me hear it one more time. Let's go. We love clapping. It's like one of our things. It's one of, must be one of our core values to clap as much as we can around here. It's crazy. But before I get, uh, before I get ahead of myself, um, something I like to do every single week, because every single week there's people I haven't met in church before, and I think that is such a blessing. That's such a great an awesome thing. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany, who is teaching Growth Track right now, we have the privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Let me hear you, Lifeline Church. Come on. I got one guy. He's like, amen. Yeah, Lifeline is cool. I like it. Awesome. Hey, if this is one of your first, second, third, fourth, fifth, seventeenth times here, um, I just want to let you know that I, I don't think you're here by accident. I think God ordained this moment, this day, for you to be here. Because God has a message of hope, encouragement, and love. He wants to speak into your life today. I believe that from the bottom of my heart. If you believe it too, say amen with me. Amen. He does. He does. He has, a, he has that message for you. And it's, the, it's true every week. I'm going to say it every week because I believe it every single week. Not just every week, but every day. God has plenty to say to your life, in your situation, everything that you're going through right now. God wants to meet you here in this moment. So I am so glad that you are here. Um, can we give it up for our first time guest today? Come on, one more time, one more time. You can do way better than that. Come on. Hey, second service, you are smaller in number, but you are higher in passion, and I like that about you. Let's keep that going. I like that. I like that. So I got a question to start us off today. Um, how many of you have ever felt excluded not included. You don't have to raise your hand. It's all good. I'm going I'm to create a complex in this place. That's not, that's not what I'm trying for. Um, you know, it's, we can just be walking around in life, just minding our own business, showing up to work, showing up to school, and we can get the, the sense and the feeling like, I'm not wanted. I'm not, I don't really feel included. You know, that happened to me a lot when I was using and drinking before I got saved. Um, I, would, I was the kind of I was the kind of drug addict who would walk into a grocery store and the checker would be like, ooh, what's this guy doing here? And then everybody would like follow I was like profiled. You ever been profiled? Don't, don't raise your hand again. But I was profiled, and I got that distinct impression like, I'm not really wanted here. I would even go to my friend's house, and they'd look at me the same way. <laughs> They'd be like, how long are you planning on staying? I'm like, as long as you'll let me stay. That's how long I'm staying. But, you know, we can just go throughout life. Maybe you've never been through that kind of experience before, but you don't even have to. Like, I, just recently, this is this is this really happened. This just happened a couple nights ago. I was going through a tub, you know, like some Tupperware. is like one of those tubs. You get it out of the garage if you're trying to clean out your garage. And so I clean out my garage, got in this tub. And it's all my old stuff that my mom dropped off to me that she didn't want to hang on to anymore. You know, my blankie. Anybody got a blankie? I, I had a blankie. It was yellow and blue, and I still got it. I put it up against my face. 30-something-year-old man. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> it was good. I liked it. But not only was that in there, but I had some uh, old report cards in there. My mom liked to keep my, uh, the little pictures I drew all the way from second grade. All the way from second grade, all the way to like sophomore, I didn't make it past sophomore year. <laughs> Disclaimer, I didn't make it past sophomore year, so that was all she had. But starting in second grade, I had all these little report cards, and you know, the teachers could write little comments in there. All the way back to second grade, Elliot doesn't like to do his work. Elliot distracts others and doesn't do even his own work and keeps others from doing their work. I'm like, dang, no wonder I went down that path. Man, it gave me a complex. That's messed up. You know what else I had in there? Because I'm barely a millennial, I had uh, participation awards in there. <laughs> oh, man, it's really funny. But, I mean, this is, this is the reality we live in. Um, but let me just tell you, uh, you may feel not loved, you may feel unincluded, you may feel like you're not really, you're subpar, but let me just tell you something, that, that God's kingdom isn't that way. God's kingdom is not that way. In, in, in earthly terms, in, in natural way, I mean, you, you try and get into a college, and, and they are going to vet you. You know, they're going to go in, and they're going to say, give me, your, give me your resume, give me your transcript, only the best of the best, right? Only the best of the best. You go in for a better job, they're going to say, how long have you been working at that old job? Let me call your boss. Let me see what's going on. Only the best of the best. But let me tell you something. God's kingdom does not work that way. God's kingdom says, hey, everybody. God's kingdom is inclusive. 
God's God, the way he speaks over us is, no, you are welcome here. You are invited here. You know what? Even, even on top of that, you may have all this on your resume, all this bad stuff. You, I want you here. That's what God says to us. That's what God says to you. That's what he says to me. God's kingdom is very inclusive, not as selective. So if you've ever felt unwanted, unwelcome, whether it was real or imagined. Let me tell you something. That wasn't God's kingdom. This is an earthly kingdom coming against you. But let me tell you, God's kingdom for you, God's word for you is you are welcome. You are accepted. You are loved. You are forgiven. Someone say amen right there. That's a good thing. So God wants his house. Let me just tell you, based on everything I just said, God wants his house full. He wants his house full. Say it with me. God wants his house full. Now this time, look around. I say, God wants his house full. Yeah, there's, see, right over here, there's a little gap right there, a little gap right there. There's room for more. And I've got the scriptures that talk about this. This is very important in our, in our theology, but it's also very important in our understanding of how God views us. So we're going we're gonna to talk about a lot of scripture today. You can do your best to keep up with me. Um, but let me just tell you, we're going to be in Luke 14, and we're going to be in Matthew 22. Find your way to Luke 14 and find your way to Matthew 22. That will get you started, but, you know, do your best. We got it on the screens for you, so that'll help a lot. Let's start right here in Luke 14. This is called the parable of the great feast. Are you ready? Here we go. Starting in verse 15, hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with, a, with this story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. I think this is funny. You know, you ever invite somebody to God's house and they're like, oh, no, nah, man, I can't. I can't. Well, what if they, what if they hit you with some of this? Hey, they all make you see One said, I've just bought a field and must inspect it. They're like, I, gotta look, I got some dirt to look at. I can't come to church with you. I got some dirt I need to like. I'm not sure if this dirt is like good dirt or bad. I have to inspect this field. I can't come. Well, I don't know what that means, so let's just keep going. So please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen, and I want to try them out. Wait, you try them out? He's like hopping on some oxen and be like, woo it works. Hold on, I got to try out some oxen. Can't come to your banquet because I've got to try out my oxen. What are you talking about? Okay, let's, let's talk about this next guy. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Ding, 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 ding. We got one guy who had a good excuse. Sorry, I'd love to come to your party, but I just got married. I'm not available for the next 40 years, okay? I cannot make it. I am tied. I'm, I was going to say tied down, but no. No, no, no. See, because my wife isn't sitting in this service, so it's like, Who's going who's gonna to reel me back in? Man, who's going to do it? The story goes on to say this. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. Everybody say room for more. There is still room for more. So his master said, go out to the country lanes behind the bushes. Go look at the street corners. Go look at where they're camped out on the side of the road out there. And don't just invite them. Urge anyone you find to come. Urge them to come so that my house will be full. It seems to me like God wants his house to be full. For none of those I first invited will get the smallest taste of my banquet. Ah, oh, salty much, Lord? <laughs> none of those people I first invited, man, I invited them first, and I still want them to come, but now I'm going to try and get at them with jealousy. Well, that's weird, but it's, it sounds like that's what he's saying. It sounds to me, I'm just reading this thing the same way you are. It seems to me like God is willing to go to great lengths to get not only the new people to come, but to get the old pe older people, the old saints, to see what's going on here. So in order to understand this story completely, what we have to do is we have to read it in all of the, all the places it's found in Scripture. So another place it's found is in Matthew 22. And Matthew finds a little bit of this story. He, he actually completes it. He ends the story 
um, that this is not included in the, in the other part. Matthew 22, starting in verse 11, let's read. But when the king came to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. The king said to his aides, bind his hands and his feet and throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Dang, Lord, you crazy. Well, he's not crazy. He's Lord. He must know what he's doing because he said this, for many are called. All. Many are called. But few are chosen. I, I believe, I believe this with all my heart, I believe that, that Jesus was trying to make two points, two main points in this parable. Number one, go get everybody and fill the house. Number one, go get everybody and fill the house. Point number two is I'll sort them out. He, he said, I'll sort them out. You go get them, bring them in, and God says, but I will, I will sort them out. See, a lot of us get that backwards. We want to sort people out before we invite them in. It's quiet for a reason <laughs> because y'all are seeing everything going on in this world that I am, and there's a lot of polarization of people. There's a lot of people being segregated for political views, for this, that, and the other thing, and it's just not right. It's just not right. I'm not here to make a political stand. I I'm, here to, I'm here to let all of us know that in this house, all are welcome. In this house, all are welcome. God will sort them out, but that's not our job. The master comes in and says, hey, wait, I thought you were supposed to be wearing wedding clothes. What's up with that? Our job is to bring them in. God's job is to sort them out. Let's never get that mistaken. Let's never get that confused. All right, let's, let's listen to it another way. In Matthew 4, Jesus said this. He called out to them. He said, come follow me. I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets. Everybody say nets. Nets. That was sad, but we're going to keep going. <gasps> they left their nets at once and followed them. Here's the thing about nets. Nets are very non-selective. When you're going fishing and you use a net, you ain't picking and choosing which fish you're looking for. You ain't going like, here, this one fish, I'm going to use my little harpoon and try and get this one little fish. No, a net says, I'm going to drop some feed in. I'm going to let them all congregate. I'm going to go whoop, and I'm going to catch them all. I'm going to sort them out once they're in the boat. Okay, that's important. That's important for us to understand. They're very non-selective. So when Jesus was saying to fish for people, he was not calling us to be selective with people. He was saying to cast the net. When Peter preached, preached the first sermon out of that balcony window, what, what did he do? Hey, everybody. He was just yelling it out. He was just calling it out for anyone who would hear. And once they got involved, once they came in, well, you can just read your own New Testament about that. There was, there was plenty of judgment that happened, but it wasn't on the front end. It was in process. I'm, I'm, try, I'm going somewhere with this. I want you to see this. When he says the fish for people, he does not say to be selective about it, but inclusive. To anyone who listens, to the Jews first, then the Gentiles, which means the rest of us, the rest of us. Jesus goes even further than that. Still in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 12. This is the parable of the lost sheep. You probably heard this before. If you've been coming to church any length of time, you've heard this story before. If you listen to Christian radio, you've heard the song, Leaves the 99. You're like, oh, I'm crying just thinking about it. I know it's good. I know it's good. But listen to what it really says. Listen to what this story says. This is a parable. This is a story. He made it up to, to make a point. Verse 12 in chapter 18. If a man has 100 sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out and search for the lost one? And if he finds it, if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more. Everybody say more. He'll rejoice over it more. More than the 99 that were already found. They didn't wander away. Let me explain it to you. There is a level of, of excitement that God has when a lost son and daughter comes into this house. You know what this means? If you happen to be far from God today, and I'm not going to blast you, I'm not going to call you out. If you happen to be far from God today, you don't know God, you're not walking with God as, as closely as you know you should, and maybe you're on the outskirts, maybe you're distant, maybe you used to come to church, but you just come to church for whatever reason. Let me just tell you, if you're here today and that's you, God is more excited about you being there than he is about me being here. Because I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm found. I'm all right. Okay, fine. 
God, though, he rejoices and jumps up and down, dances, rejoices when someone who's far from him comes home. Do you remind you of another parable? Parable of the lost son. Parable of the lost son. You know, um, we're going to get to that, but, you know, when I talk, when, sometimes when I talk about this, it makes people who believed in God a long time, makes them mad. Makes them mad. It's like, well, what do you mean? It's, it can't, we have a saying around here, it can be a little bit about us, but it can't be all about us. It cannot be all about us. And let me just tell you, I'm in a position to make this church all about me, but I cannot allow that to happen. I can't allow that to happen because I'm, I'm in that category. Man, I've been found for a little while. I've been coming to church for 10 years. And for some of you, that's like 10 years and you already up there talking. For some of you, that's not very long. But for some of you, that's a real long time. Coming to church for 10 years would be a long time, according to you. But you know what? God has a level of excitement and passion and expectation and celebration when someone who's far from him comes home. It's something we have to understand. We have to grasp. And when it makes people mad, I just tell them, get over it, man. <laughs> if, you've been, if you've been walking with God a long time, and that, and that kind of thinking makes you mad. You've been, you've been serving God so long, you should know this by now. It's not about you. Man, you know when it was about you? When you were lost. And you, you're so glad that someone invited you to church and there was a seat ready for you when you came. But now it's like, oh, that's my seat. <laughs> we talked about that last week a little bit, didn't we? Would you give up your seat for someone who was far from God? Y'all know you, you would. But let's examine that a little, a little more closely. You know, maybe it's more than just the seat. Maybe it's our preference. Maybe it's what we're willing to do. Maybe it's what we're willing to go through. What kind of music are we willing to listen to? Let me just explain something to you. If polka music, I'm, I shouldn't even go there, but I'm going to go there. You second service, y'all. You get extra. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, and I believe this with, from the bottom of my heart. If polka music, polka worship music, means more people are going to get saved and more people will end up coming, than polka music it is. And coming from a musician, someone who likes music, that is hard to even get out of my mouth. I don't even want to say it because it's, come on. Okay, we're not doing polka music, everybody. Don't go and tell your friends, oh, they like polka music over there. We're not doing that. All I'm trying to say is, am I willing to give up my preference to see more lost people get saved? That's an important question that we need to really ask ourselves. It's important. I got a story about this. Jesus told this story. And you've all heard this story, most likely, if you've been in church any length of time, it's a parable of the lost son, but it's the end of the story I want us to pay close attention to, but we're going to read the whole thing. Here we go, Luke 15, starting in verse 11. To illustrate this point further, it's like, and in another place in the Bible, and in another place in the Bible, and in another place in the Bible, Jesus talks about this stuff a lot, you'll see. Verse 11, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons. How many sons did the man have? an older and a younger. The, young, the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. I'm not willing to wait until you die to get the money that's due me. I want it now. So the father agreed. Father agreed to divide his wealth between his two sons. A few days later, this younger son packed up all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted his money in wild living. About this time, the money ran out. A great famine swept over the land. He began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods that he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Man, aren't you glad that God even accept, accepts us when we're down and out like this kid right here? I know that I felt that way when I came here, and I know that some of you felt the same way, that even though I was sloppy in the pig pen, God said, no, I'm, I'm dealing with you because it's about to happen right here. Verse 17, when he finally came to his senses. Man, I don't care how much of a mess you're in. I don't care how, you may look good on the outside, but I don't care how messy your marriage is. I don't care how messy your family is. I don't care how messy your finances are. I don't care how messy all those relationships are. But when we come to our senses and know, wait a second, but my, in my father's house, in my father's house, things are different. He said, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare, and I'm dying of hunger over here. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. He's rehearsing in his mind how I'm going to apologize. You ever done that? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I've done it. I know I need to eat crow. Anyone ever heard that expression before, eating crow? Because nobody wants to do it. <laughs> 
it's usually about repenting and apologizing or doing something you don't want to do. I've had to do that plenty of times. And you rehearse in your mind, oh, I'm going to tell them, you know, oh, I was, I was dumb. I was stupid. I'm so sorry. Please, God, forgive me. You know, how many Hail Marys do I need to do? How much, how much repenting do I need to do? How many slaps do I need? How much punishment do I need to go through? You start rehearsing in your mind about how bad you are and how much you don't deserve it. Listen to this. Verse 20, he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. See, this is powerful for me because the father wasn't just sitting there like, I was waiting for you to come back so I could. He ran to his son. He ran to his son. He ran to his son and said, I'm so, I've been waiting for this day. I've been praying for this. I've been waiting for this. I'm so excited that you're home, son. I've been waiting for this. And in this culture, running like that was like, you didn't do that. 2,000 years ago, when you, when you wore the robe down here and a father of a big estate, it was undignified to run, much less kiss your son in public. Jesus is telling a story that this is how the father sees us. When we come to him, no matter what we've been through, the son, oh, he begins to rehearse. He begins to rehearse. His, fa- his father came running to him, sunk, and here the son goes, Father, I've sinned. Here goes the rehearsal, right? Here goes the, oh, I'm so miserable. I'm so bad. I, I suck at life. I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Don't you ever feel that way sometimes? God, I'm not worthy. I, I don't know why you'd let me back, but, Lord, I'm just begging you. And the father said, shh. Shut it right there. Shut it right there. I'm cutting you off. And he called to his servants. He called to the servants. He didn't even acknowledge it. It's like, Father, aren't you going to say hi to me? And the Father is too busy getting the celebration ready. We need to understand this. Called to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. You know that emergency fund we've been saving up for? Cash it out. We're having a party today. We're not waiting until when your birthday is coming up. No, we're having a party today because my son was lost, but now he's home. Can someone say amen who's been returned back to their father and knows what it feels like to be accepted and loved by him? Man, that's for me. I just, I can't help myself. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. (laughs) The party. It's a party. Now, this is where the story gets interesting for me. You'd think the story would end there. It doesn't. It doesn't. The story goes on to talk about another group of people, not the younger sons, the, the older ones. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working as an usher and a greeter and a worship team member and I've been setting up these chairs for years, and I've been, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. When he returned home, he heard the music and the dancing in the house. Now, let me tell you, is this God's house? God, you can answer. Is this God's house? This is God's house, isn't it? Yeah, wherever we meet is God's house, because wherever we are, God dwells there, right? There was music and dancing in the house. Let, let me get the worship leader come out in me for just a second and preach at you. This music that we're doing, the reason why we have celebratory music and you can do all this, you can feel all this, and you're like, man, it's like a, it's like a rave in there. Well, yeah, because we're having a party in here. Why? Because lost sons and daughters are coming home, and we can't help but celebrate. This is a celebration. One of our values here of why we're even doing church, what we want to bring to the table, we're celebrating. Because in this church, we have new people showing up every single week and that's a big deal you don't we don't realize it because you're you're already here a lot of you like just you're used to it but let me tell you that's not always the case so guess what we're gonna celebrate every single week not only the fact that new people are coming but that we've been saved and the older son heard the dancing and the music and he's like he got mad he got mad look at what it says he asked one of the servants what's going on And the servant said, your brother is back. Notice that the servant said, this is your brother. But later, we're going to see that the the older brother doesn't even want to think about this guy that way. The servant said, your brother is back. He was told, your father has killed the fattened calf, cashed out the emergency savings fund. And they're celebrating because of his safe return. 
And how do you think that made the older brother feel? The older brother was happy. The older brother was started celebrating because his brother, who was dead and lost, is now found. He was, oh, that's not what it says. He was angry. He was mad. The older brother was, was angry. And, oh, we want to say, oh, yeah, that ain't right, but we need to realize, are we acting this way too sometimes? The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. The father came out and begged him. Now, notice this. The father is not unsympathetic. The father is not unsympathetic when people like me get caught up in our own thinking, get caught up in ourselves, and we want to start thinking, well, you know, I, I like it this way. I like it that way. It's all about me. And, well, these people want to come in and change everything. Well, we've been doing things. It's fine. And God is sympathetic to me, and I thank God for that. He's, he's sympathetic. He, he wants to reassure us and says, and says he, he begs us. He replied, all these years, the, the brother says this, all these years I've slaved for you. I never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never even gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. You know what I hear right there? My two- and three-year-old whining at me. That's what I hear because I have a two- and three-year-old right now. And you know, you never give me anything. It's <laughs> exactly what it sounds like. You know, I, they want a pop. I want a popsicle. You can't have a popsicle right now. It's one in the afternoon. Hey, <laughs> you never give me anything. That's what I hear right there. Man, you. May, shh, what you talking about never give you anything? Everything I have is yours. Everything I have, it goes on to say that. Yet when this son of yours, notice the brother doesn't even want to associate. That's not my brother. That's your son. It's dirty. That's messed up. That's not my brother. That's your son, air quotes. When this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, watch him call out his brother's sins. That's a dirty move. That, isn't that a dirty move? Someone comes in, and we're celebrating for them. Yeah, but look at that. Look at that. They're still smoking and drinking and, and doing all that. Calling out the sins of someone who, who was dead but is now back in the house of God. That's messed up. You celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him this, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours we had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. This is, this is really powerful because it's a, it's a two-part story. It's a story about God's heart and the, and the Father's heart for his lost sons and daughters. Maybe they were once in the house, and they, they, they departed for a while, and they're coming back. Or maybe they were you know, ne never really knew their father. There's a lot of spiritual orphans out there who have never grown up in the church. I didn't grow up in church. You know, so when I came in, I didn't have anything to come back to. It was just the first time thing. But the story goes on and talks about once we've been saved a while. And so this message really is for everybody today. Once we've been saved a while, we can tend to get a little um, inward focused. Inward focused. It happens more often than we'd like to admit. In, in churches and in spiritual circles, we just, we start to focus, boo, right here. It's just our nature. It's our nature to do this. And this kind of insider focus, we have to fight it with everything we have. We have to fight it with everything we have. Because God says, leaves the 99 who are okay and does whatever it takes to get the one who is lost. That's so important. It's so important for us. We have a mission here, a mission statement at the church. A lot of churches have that. We have one, too. It's very important to us, and we articulate it this way. We believe it's not just the mission of this church, but it's articulated a certain way, but it's the mission of the church. It's to reach people with the love of God, restore people to fullness in Christ, and release people to do the work of the ministry. Simply put, it's, it's evangelism, discipleship, and leadership. And the, the, the more mature we get as a church, the more we want to focus on discipleship and leadership. The longer we're saved, all of us, the more we're going to want to focus on those two things. But let me tell you something. You can't do the second two without the first one. You can't disciple someone who's not here. Am I, am I breaking through today? I mean, it's the most important. It starts with that. You want to focus on only discipleship? You want to do that? Disciple the same people for 30 years? What is, that? is that really what we want? No. We have discipleship. We have equipped classes. We have Operation Solid Lives, and you can do that and know your Bible and 
memorization, all that. We have equipped classes, teach you about the Holy Spirit, teach you about biblical finances, teach you about all that stuff. And all those classes are no good if nobody's getting saved. Are, am I, are you seeing this? It's so important. We need to give people a chance. We need to give people a chance to even go through these things. I'll put it to you this way. Uh, as long as my wife and I are pastoring this church, Lifeline Church will be a church that is focused on bringing lost sons and daughters back to their father. That's what we're focused on. And if that doesn't, if that is that's something you can't work with, man, I love you. <laughs> I'm going to pray for you, but it's our focus. It's our focus. Because the longer I sit here and and the more sanctified I get, the more mature I get, the more self-focused I need to get. So I need to surround myself with people that understand this principle. I need to surround myself with church leaders. Just speaking about me personally, I need to surround myself with church leaders that never forget the main point. We're here to share the love of Jesus with a broken, hurt, and lost world. Because that's God's heart. God's heart is for the world. One of our core values here is we're fishers of men. We're fishers of men. Uh, the core value is stated like this. We will do anything short of sin to reach people with the love of God. Don't you like that? <laughs> we'll do anything short of sin. Like we will put it all out there. Aren't you glad that someone went that far for you? I, I sure glad I, you know, they did that with me. Anything short of sin to reach people with the love of God. To reach people that nobody's reaching. You have to do things that nobody's doing. And here's the thing about Lodi um, and the San Joaquin Valley. Well, anywhere, I- anywhere, anywhere. There was a lot of churches around, you know, and I've, I've visited a lot of churches. I have a lot of pastor friends here in Lodi, and I have not been. So every vacation, I like to go visit other churches. I haven't been to a church I didn't like. Haven't met a pastor in this town I didn't like. Scout's honor. I, I love it. But let me tell you, I know exactly what to expect. I go in there, and it's basically the same thing in every single place. If you've never tried it, um, you know, I want you to come here on Sundays. <laughs> but you can try it. You can be like, man, I, I get it. Oh, yeah, this many songs, and this we take communion, and this right here, it's like the same thing. But let me tell you, in order to reach people that nobody's reaching, you've got to be willing to do things that nobody's doing. We're willing to do anything short of sin to reach people with the love of God, and we're growing in that. We're growing in that. Now, you think that's a little extreme? It's not extreme compared to the Apostle Paul. Want me to show you? In Romans 9? This is crazy. A lot of people don't know this. But Paul said in Romans 9, verses 2 and 3, My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief. For my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Can I put that another way? I would be willing to die and go to hell for all eternity if that meant I could bring my lost brothers and sisters back to Christ. He didn't say they're your son and they're squandering their wealth and they're doing the prostitute thing and they're going over there. No, he said, those are my brothers and sisters and I'm willing to give not only my physical life, I'm willing to give my eternal salvation. I'm willing to sin and go to hell if that would save them. But some... Some of us, none of you, we won't even give up our preference to see some people receive salvation. I know none of you feel that way. None of you feel that way. But that's crazy to think of. Now, he said, he said if that would save them. Now, I don't believe God set up a system where we would have to sin to bring people to God. I don't think God would set things up that way. So I'm not saying go and sin, you know, and go start using drugs and drinking alcohol, and that's going to bring them in. No. No, stop right there. He said, if, if that would help, I'd do it. The willingness and passion is there. I'm willing to go all the way if it means we're going to bring lost people home to God. He said it another safer way in 1 Corinthians 9. This is one that many of you probably have heard before. Verse 19, even though I am a free man with no master, I become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law too, I lived under their law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles, I do not follow the Jewish law. I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. When he wrote that, that was extreme. And he put himself out there for some serious judgment. 
to say, I'll, I'll, I'll live under the, under the law of the Jews to, to reach them, but I'll live like these lawless Gentiles if it means reaching them. Are you catching this? He's willing to go all out. We need to catch this as a local church body who is passionate about seeing lost people get saved. I, too, live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. I do not ignore the law of God. In fact, I obey the law of Christ. He's saying that is the law of Christ to live this way. That is the law of Christ, to have such a selfless nature and to reach out to the people in need so much. That is the law of Christ, to take up your cross and die so that others might know him. That's powerful. Verse 22, when I was with those who are weak, I share their weaknesses. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything so I can save some. I do most things to spread the good news and share in its blessing. No. I do everything. Everything to spread the good news and share in this blessing. Paul was willing to give up everything. Are we willing to give up our preference? Are we willing to give up our comfort? Are we willing to give up our seat? Are we willing to give up the... Um, what are we willing to give up? Let me just put it that way. What are you willing to give up to see that neighbor come to Christ, to see that coworker come to Christ, just to see him come to church? You know, let me work on him, you know? <laughs> I'll get at him. I got jokes. I'll make him laugh. I'll make him listen. Bring him. Give him a chance at least. I know, that, I know that many of you, you care so much about doing this. So I want to give you something that you can do for the rest of your life. I want to give you a practice. I want to get to the application part of this message because I believe it's the most important part. In fact, I built this whole message around, around the, 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 this title. It's called Who's Your Five? This message is actually called Who's Your Five? And there's a little card inside of your bulletin that says My Five. I'm going to tell you who your five is right now. My Five. Now, this is something I just discovered. I just thought about um, actually another pastor friend of mine said, well, why don't you try this? And so I did it myself this last week. And some of you might be thinking, well, what is it? Well, what's this five? My five, I want you to write down in, on that card right there. And I want you to take out a pen. I want you to go ahead and do this right now. I don't care if you haven't ever been to church. This is the only time you've ever been to church. I'm going to explain to you how powerful this can be even for your life. You might be thinking, well, I don't know why I need to do this. Let me, I'll get there. I'll get to that. Take out a pen. Take out that card. I want you to write down five names of people you want to see come to the house of the Lord. I want you to write down five names of people that you want to see receive salvation. Now, I just started doing that this week, and I invited, I invited them, and it was scary. It was crazy, but let me tell you what to do with these names because it doesn't just start with the invite. I want you to write down their names, but I want you to put this card in a place that you're going to see it every single day. Okay, you could put it in your car. You could put it on your bathroom mirror. If you read your Bible every day, you can put it in your Bible. But if you don't read your Bible every day, put it somewhere you're going to see it every day. Read your Bible every day, everybody. It's a good thing to do. But put it somewhere where you're going to see it every single day, and I want you to pray for these five people every day. Now, this prayer doesn't have to be long. This prayer can be short. Let me give you an example. You could just say, say it like this. Lord, I, I pray for so-and-so, 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 and so-and-so, that, Lord, that their heart would be open to receive what you have for them, Lord, that when I invite them, that they would be open and actually hearing from you and not just me. Amen. I mean, that was all of 15 seconds right there. You can do this. You can totally do this. Because I don't want you running out there and inviting people, bring them in without praying for them. Because you might use the words, but God is speaking to their hearts. You know, the most powerful stories we hear is when, I, when I'm preaching a message or when I'm saying something and, and someone comes to me after and said, you have no idea that I've been rehearsing that in my mind. I don't know why I've been thinking about that, but let me tell you, with the help of God, these invites are more powerful. These invites are more powerful. So the next thing to do is obvious. I want you to invite them every single week. And this might be the hardest part for you. And let me be honest, it was kind of hard for me too. I actually had to type out the text message. And then send it out to him. And I had to fill out the, the Facebook message and send it out to him. I actually had to stand in front of their face and say, hey, neighbor. Um, <laughs> no, I, wasn't, I didn't look like that. But I felt like that on the inside. It's, it's kind of nerve-wracking to actually put yourself out there and say, hey, man, you, you should come. I think you really like it. Just come. We got good classrooms for your kids. You'll like it. You'll like it. And when you're praying for them, you'd be, you'd be surprised what their responses are. 
they say, you know, actually, uh, I've been kind of thinking about that. I got that when I, when I invited my five. I actually got that response. You know, I've actually been kind of thinking about that. You have. <laughs> well, then come then. It's going to be good. In fact, and this is the lifelong practice of it. Once someone either says to you, you know, I'm good, no thank you, or whatever, or actually shows up, you take that name and replace it with another one. This is the recipe to keep us out of our selfishness, self-centeredness, and to always be thinking, but who is this empty chair for right here? Whose son and daughter should be sitting right there in that chair who's far from God? Did you know that 80% of people would come to church if you just asked them? That's a lot. That's a big percentage. You know, another a stat that I don't like as much, every single year after the first, I think they said three years, the longer you've been saved, the less people start inviting to church. You know why that is? I believe it's because of the story Jesus told. The older brother always struggles, and the more holy we get, the more sanctified we get, the less about others we think about. It's our nature. So we have to fight this. We have to hear messages like this. We have to discipline ourselves and say, you know what? No, I'm not just going to think about me, my experience. I hope he preaches about something I want to hear about. You know, I'm gonna, I need prayer. I need this. I need that. No, what does so-and-so need? What do those people on your list need? What, what, what does God want to speak to them? And maybe you're, you're brand newish here and you're like, Ellie, I'm a little new here. You know, it's my first Sunday. You want me to invite five people? You know, I'm the one who needs refreshment. I'm the one who needs encouragement. I'm brand new here. Well, let me tell you something about, about God. Let me, let me, if you need encouragement, Proverbs 11 says, those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So it's maybe the recipe that is exactly what you needed. Maybe exactly what you need is to stop thinking about what I need and try and take care of myself. But what if I start taking care of something else? That actually settles my issue. Isn't that crazy? So I, I'm from recovery, and I go to Narcotics. I used to go to Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. You know the first thing they make you do? You show up in there, they make you serve others. That's a biblical program. They actually created out of biblical principles. But they say the first thing you need to do is you just need to start serving others. Because your recovery, but I'm telling you, your relationship with God, your spiritual refreshment comes from how you learn to refresh others. This is crucial. This is crucial. God wants his house full. God wants his house full, not because he wants a crowd, okay, but because every single person, every single person on that list, every single person you might be thinking of in your mind right now, that's a son and daughter of the most high God. They were created in his image, and he loves them so much. And yet, like the, like the master of the house, like the king of the house, the, what we started with, he sends us, his servants, his people, to go bring them in, to go bring them in. Not to judge and condemn and cherry pick and just bring people that we like. No, we're gonna bring, we're gonna bring them in. God cares about people. It's not just about a crowd. He, every, every chair represents a person that, that needs to hear this message, that needs to hear the salvation message, the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you can bring someone like that back home, how do you think God is gonna deal with you? It's gonna be good. <laughs> He's going to appreciate it. He's going to deal with you. Because what a man sows, that he also reaps. You bring refreshment to others, you're going to receive refreshment back. You sow generosity into others, you're going to receive generosity from God. This is exactly what I think is missing in, in many of our lives. Mine included. Mine included. Is a genuine concern and passion for people who are far from God. You know, I'm just like anybody else, man. I get wrapped up in my own life. I get wrapped up in what I need to do. I get wrapped up in the work of the ministry. You know, I'm writing a message and blah, 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 blah. And I just forget to invite people that I see at the gym. People, they reach out to me. It's like, oh, I saw your church sh shirt. You know, I got a little church shirt. I work out. And they, and they come out to me and be like, hey, that's cool. You like this? And I don't even think to invite them because I'm all wrapped up in myself. I'm just being honest with you guys. So if I know if I'm dealing with that, I know many of us, that's why we need to hear this message today. We need to remember that that person is smiling on the outside, but inside they're begging for a, for a place to belong, for a place to feel loved, 
for a place to be encouraged, for a place where they can have their sins forgiven. You know, when I, when I first started coming to this church, I was a name on somebody's list. Somebody invited me. They tricked me to get me here. They tricked me. I'm telling you the truth. My friend promised me, hey, if you come, we'll get you on the band. <laughs> I played music, you know, and they were like, I'll get you on the band. And he, he tricked me. And then when he brought me in here, he introduced me to the worship leader, and then they stuck me in the sound booth. Man, that's dirty. I ain't going to stick me in the sound booth. I'm a talented musician. Man, come on, let's do it. But no, when, when he tricked me and brought me into those doors and urged me to come, when I walked through those doors, I was home. I was home. And it was these, and it was these faithful servants, actually these older siblings, these older children of God, these uh, grandparents, these people that could be my mother and father because my mother and father lived far away. They mothered and fathered me and loved me, and I knew right then I was home. I was home. Let me tell you, man, if, if, if me, who is standing before you as, as your pastor today, was brought because of an invite, what about those people on your list right now? What might be their calling? What might be their mission? What might God have in store for them if we would just get, get past the issues that we're dealing with, the little, uh, I'm nervous to ask, I'm nervous to bring, what if they say no, but what if they say yes? And what if they come, and what if God gets a hold of their heart and changes their life forever and then changes their family tree forever? It's, it's too much for me to think about sometimes. God met me in my mess, and now I preach his message. What about those people on your list? What might he have for them? Because this is a place where I'm, I'm promising you, and they're going to hear love, encouragement, and hope. You get them here. I'm going to give them everything I got, and every single member of this dream team is going to do the same thing. We're going to let people know they're loved, accepted, forgiven. And for some of you here today, that's exactly the message I want to bring to you as we close. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I'm going to do something that we we do normally do every single week. We're going to play a little music in a moment, but don't let that distract you. What I want you to do right now is everybody, every head down, every eye closed, everybody's just in a private moment. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. I want you to ask God. God, what are, you, what are you trying to speak to me? Go ahead. If you ask him right now, I'm, I'm believing God wants to speak something to you right now in this moment. God, what are you trying to speak? I believe that even though I spoke many words, that God is speaking directly to your hearts today maybe even a different thing to every person. I want to speak to two groups of people today. Maybe that you've been far from God for a while. Maybe you used to have a relationship with him and you used to be close and you used to read your Bible, you used to pray, you used to have a relationship with him. You, got, you and God were tight. You were tight. Somewhere along the line, maybe it was recently, something happened or you, know, you drifted away or maybe something, maybe something actually happened that drove a wedge in between the relationship that you and God had. And you're here today, and you just heard God speak to you. In a moment, I'm going to give you an invitation to say, I'm renewing my commitment to you, Lord. And I want to walk with you. I want to know you. I want to know your forgiveness. I want to know your grace. And I know just like the Father runs to the Son, Lord, you're running to me. Father, you are running to me. You've been waiting for this moment. I want to speak to another group of people. Maybe you've never known the Lord. Maybe you're more like me where you didn't grow up with a relationship with God and you got tricked into being here today. <laughs> or maybe you just wanted to or something led you to be here and you heard a version of God that you've never heard before. A version of God where he wants you to be involved. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to be in his family and a part of everything that he's doing in his kingdom. But he's not just standing at the door, tapping his foot, waiting for you to show up so he can scold you, but he runs to you and welcomes you home. And with all the love and grace that our Father in heaven has, he's urging you to make a commitment today. So if I described you in any way this morning, 
what I want to do is give you an, an invitation to, to make a commitment to him. Maybe it's a, a renewing commitment. I want to renew my relationship with you, God, or I want to make a fresh new commitment, one I've never made before. So if I described you, heads down, eyes closed, go ahead, be bold about it. One, two, three, go ahead, lift your hand and say, God, I'm, I'm coming back home. I'm coming back home to you, and I want to give my life to you. Hallelujah. Don't miss the moment, everybody. Amen. Amen. Let's all pray this prayer together. If you believe it in your heart, I want you to say it out loud with me. Father God, I give my life to you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for my sins. I give you my life. Show me the way. Make me new. Amen. Can we clap our hands for everybody who made a decision today?